Okay, so folks, we are going to do a walkthrough through um, of two Senate bills, which um, S219 and S119, they're both um, regarding um, policing. We don't actually have the bills yet. The Senate is still working on them, but we should have them uh, either later today, they would be messaged over or tomorrow. But um, we thought it was important to at least get an understanding of them. And uh, so we could, so we could hopefully move forward on them. And uh, we also thought it'd be best if both committees could hear the testimony together um, as it would be most efficient. Uh, so I, um, I'm gonna start with, with Bryn. Good morning, Bryn. Good morning, committee. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, great. So Bryn, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your flexibility. I imagine you are in high demand today. We'll have a long day, so I appreciate it. So um, so folks, do you have uh, 219 and 119 in front of you? Sorry, I should have asked that already or have access to it. Okay, great. And um, and Bryn, I think, I think probably the best thing to do would be if you could walk through both bills and then we'll have witnesses <clears throat> speak to both of them. I think it it might be more efficient that way and we won't jump around as much. And um, and a committee member, certainly, I'm speaking to both committees. If you have questions for Bryn as she's going along, uh, you know, certainly raise your hands. And we do have, have witnesses this morning and this afternoon. So, okay, thank you. Okay, uh, good morning committees. For the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council. I'm here to talk about S-119 and S-219. Um, does the committee have a preference uh, on which bill I begin with? I think that 119 might be on the agenda first. I didn't know if there was a preferred order. Right, um, you're right, it is. Um, how about 219? Because I think 219 might be a little bit more straightforward. Sure. Thanks. Okay, so um, you should have two documents for S219. There is um, a Senate Judiciary Amendment, the 10-page uh, bill as it came out of Senate Judiciary. And then there's also a two-page um, individual amendment that was made by all five members of the committee um, that amends their amendment. So I'm going to start with that two-page bill because that uh, that's actually the first section that, that will wind up being the first section of 219 as it comes to you. So if everybody has that, it's an instance of, of amendment and the first amendment adds the section A1 to the bill, which is a legislative intent section. So I'm just gonna keep going and hope that you all have that in front of you. <laughs> um, so that's a, it's a two part legislative intent uh, section. The first part, subsection A, um, references the work of the General Assembly over the last several years on um, addressing systemic racism and disproportionate use of force by law enforcement. And it specifically goes through several bills. Um, Act 54 from 2000, and so many of these are gonna be familiar to these two committees, um, perhaps especially the GovOps committee. So 2017 Act 54, that was the RDAP bill that created the Racial Disparities Advisory Panel. Um, 2018 Act 9, that was the act relating to racial equity in state government that created the position of the Executive Director of Racial Equity. 2013 Act 180, um, that is the, the act that relates to tasers, the use of tasers by law enforcement and the associated training requirements. 2016 Act 163, um, that is the act that required that the um, Law Enforcement Advisory Board create a model policy for the use of body cameras. 2017 Act 56, that is the Professional Regulation of Law Enforcement Bill. And then it also references S338, which doesn't have an act number yet. Um, that's the Justice Reinvestment Bill. Um, and then lastly, on the bottom of the page there, it references the fact that several committees um, continue to study these issues um, and specifically also working on requiring a model policy for the use of body cameras. 
And so in conclusion, this act represents um, just one step in the legislature's ongoing effort to address uh, racial bias and, and increase accountability in policing. So that whole section is sort of designed to say this is um, a continuation of the legislature's work, not the culmination of its work. Um, subsection B says that it's the intent of the General Assembly um, that law enforcement agencies in Vermont use community police policing strategies um, to develop collaborative partnerships between communities and law enforcement and adopt policies and practices that um, adopt or reflect a guardian mindset towards the citizens that law enforcement serves and to establish a culture of transparency and accountability that both promote public safety and foster public trust. And to that end, um, it's the intent of the General Assembly that uh, law enforcement use de-escalation strategies first <clears throat> prior to um, using force in every situation. So, sorry about that. <laughs> if you hold on one second, I can let the dog out. I'm sorry. It's fine. My, my dog is looking around saying, hmm, where's that coming from? So I do see that some of you are uh, having difficulty finding this. And um, actually, I'm sorry, I should have had it posted on our website. Um, I found it on Senate Judiciary's website yesterday. And it's, uh, let's see, I think it's document 1.2 under 219, but that's where I found it. Mm. Okay, so is it, is, does it, everyone has that document? And am I talking about documents that people don't have? Okay, great, great. On today for GovOps too. It is on your, okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I don't see it on, I didn't see it on our website, but, <clears throat> but um, you can get it at Senate Judiciary. Okay. I would assume we're looking at draft 3.1. To, um, yes. Well, that's for 219, but the actual- 2.1. The actual intent language is separate. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning. Morning. Sorry, I'm late. No worries. We're just starting with the uh, with the walkthrough of 219, and Brina's yeah. going to do walkthroughs of both the bills together, um, not as reflected on the on the agenda. So, okay, great. Go ahead. Thank you, Bryn. Sure. So, um, subsection B there really reflects. Um, some of the concepts that are incorporated in the 21st century, century policing report um, without specifically naming it, um, just to be clear. And then the second instance of amendment there, um, I'm just strikes out a some language in um, 219 that refers to a new crime. I think it will be easier if I explain that once we actually get to that section of 219. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to end with the that instances of amendment there and move on to 219 itself unless there's any questions. Yeah, actually, um, I see a hand and I have a question as well. Um, was there any discussion about um, whether or not to actually name the 21st century reporting? No, that wasn't specifically discussed in committee. Um, the 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 desire of the committee was to make it clear that um, law enforcement, it was the intent of the General Assembly that law enforcement use de-escalation tactics prior to using force. Um, and to flesh that out, um, we, went, we went ahead and added some language that came from the 21st Century Policing Report, but there wasn't this conversation about specifically naming it. Okay, thank you, that, that, that's helpful. Um, and I. Folks, I do want to um, let people know that I actually had spoken with Senator Sears and I very much appreciate this intent language because I think it's important for um, for the body and for, for others to know that this really is um, a continuation of a larger conversation and a larger body of work and, um, you know, building on what we've done before and also looking forward. And I know that there are at least three bills in the Senate um, that are moving forward, and certainly we have bills in the House. So I do appreciate uh, seeing this language in here, and uh, and let's sort of bookmark the idea of, of naming 21st century policing because I think it is uh, it's something that is recognizable and understood by law enforcement. And take, take uh, get some testimony on that. Um, okay, Martin, I see your hand. 
Uh, yeah, uh, Bryn, <clears throat> looking at uh, subsection A, the 2016 Act number 163, an act relating to model state policy use of body cameras by law enforcement officers. I see, I see that that act actually uh, required a report uh, proposed legislation uh, by the end of December of 2016. And was anything ever done with the proposed legislation? Do we, did those model policies that this act required, did they get put into effect? Um, so there is a model policy, uh, LEAB model policy on the use of body cameras, but no further legislation resulted from that report. So a model policy exists, but there's not a requirement currently that law enforcement agencies adopt that policy. Um, okay, well, I guess this is then a, a comment for folks just to, to perhaps uh, mark this, that it doesn't seem like we should put that one in there as something that we've accomplished when, when we haven't finished accomplishing that. I mean, it, it suggests that we have model policy that is required, and, and that's not the case. So, um, so I, I would just flag that as a possible... I think it's questionable to put that in as, as one of the things that we've really accomplished. I would just add that um, I know that the Senate, Senate Government Operations Committee is working on um, some language right now that may require that be a, a state required policy, that specific LEAB model policy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands, but I want to make sure I'm not missing anybody. If uh, anybody just jump on in, if you do have a question for Bryn. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'm going to move to S219. That's um, the amendment that came out of Senate Judiciary. It's the 10 page document that's draft 3.1. So letting you all get to that. Um, the first couple of sections on, about, of um, this bill deal with law enforcement race data collection. Maxine, can I ask a real quick question? I just want to get clarification on the, on the amendment that we were looking at before. Is that draft number 2.1? Is that yes. what we were looking at? Okay, thank you. So section one of S219, um, make state grant funding to law enforcement agencies contingent on the Secretary of Administration confirming that the law enforcement agency has complied with race data reporting requirements that are set forth in statute at least six months prior to the Secretary's review. So within the last six months, um, law enforcement agencies have to have complied with those race data reporting requirements in order to receive state grant funding. The section two is a related section, um, I'm on page two now, that requires the Secretary of Administration to notify all law enforcement agencies about this new requirement that you set forth in section one um, by August 1st of this year. And it requires that the Secretary let, every, let law enforcement agencies know that this requirement takes effect on January 1st of 2021. And beginning on that date, law enforcement um, receipt of state grant funding is going to be contingent on their having complied with the race data reporting requirements set out in statute. That's, any questions there? Can I move on to section three? <clears throat> also about race data I, reporting. I, I just, I'm sorry, I do see um, two, um, two hands up. Um, I see Representative Hooper and Representative Burdett, so. I have a question on section three, so I'll defer until then. <laughs> Sorry, um, <laughs> uh, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and it's nice to hear another voice besides all of ours. So, <laughs> um, Bryn, uh, as far as the reporting goes now, what are the? Uh, I don't know if they're recommendations or requirements that. Um, uh, police departments pass along this information. So you're, we're going to look at that statute in the next section. Right now it is required um, that law enforcement report this, gather certain information at 
um, every roadside stop and report that information to certain entities on an annual basis. Okay. So it is required by law currently. So, okay, great, thank you. So Bryn, before you go into it, on, on three, my concern or question, I guess, is uh, when you get down to E1, between B and C, it almost seems like, you know, if the reason for the stop is a tail light and the type of search it was conducted, you kind of miss a step in there maybe that would be valuable reporting and what the probable cause was for the actual stop. Uh, you make a kind of a jump from, I've got you on the side of the road to I'm in your trunk. And I'd kind of like to know why. Right, that, um, that has not data that has historically been collected as far as I understand. Um, I think that it, maybe the reason for the stop uh, includes the probable cause that the um, law enforcement agency had or the reasonable suspicion, um, but I'm not sure. If specifically, if we're talking about how people get into trouble, that's kind of one. Maybe somebody else on the committee has an opinion. Or also, we will be um, hearing from DPS, so perhaps we could okay. wait for our witnesses. Um, okay, I see um, Representative Harrison. Thank you. Bryn, um, if you go back to Section 1, it says the Secretary shall approve grants only if they have complied with the race data reporting uh, six months prior. But I thought you just said that it was required annually. Does that potentially run into a problem where maybe they submitted the data seven months ago and now not available for the grants? They're still complying with the annual requirement. Right, so um, the, I think that the idea is that they have complied they have complied with those race data reporting requirements within the last six months, meaning they, um, they are up to date in terms of submitting that data annually um, so that it's not, it's not further out than, um, than one year. Does that make sense? Um, maybe it does. I just trying to get it through my um, head where there's a potential break. It seems to me that it should be the same period. Either it's one year and that's what, you know, concurrent with the reporting requirement or it's six months and we change the reporting requirement to every six months. That may, it may make it clearer if it's within the last year. I think the idea was that they have complied, meaning they have submitted the data with it on that annual basis within the last six months. So I think essentially it gives them a six month cushion. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Thank you. Thank That's you. The way I read it. Tom. Yeah, Bryn, are, are we gonna get into any information about uh, um, how, well, it wouldn't be how well they're doing, but how, how the uh, departments are doing as far as passing this information along? So that, I think that you're gonna hear from witnesses about okay. that. Uh, that would have been my guess, but thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're, go ahead, thanks, Bryn. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to section three. This is on page two. So this is the, um, this statute sets out what uh, what data collection law enforcement agencies need to do at roadside stops. And what the language here does at the bottom of page two is requires that um, roadside stop data that's collected to include um, use of physical force, data about the use of physical force. Um, so it provides that whether physical force was employed or threatened in, infection, in effectuating the stop, and if so, what type of force was employed and whether that force resulted in serious bodily injury or death. And um, later on in this section, we're gonna talk about what, that, what physical force means. We've put some parameters around physical force. So I'll get there in a moment. 
I'm going to turn to page um, three now. Excuse me, I do see uh, Martin's hand is up. I think this is a quick question. Uh, what does effectuating the stop mean? Does that mean the whole course of the stop or only just the getting the car to pull over? What does so that mean? We, there was testimony from law enforcement that they interpret that to mean carrying out the stop. Um, so getting the car to pull over um, and what, what occurs after that. So um, I understand that it may be a bit clear for lay people to say effectuating or during the stop. Um, that may make more sense um, from a lay person standpoint. But my understanding is that law enforcement understands that term to mean carrying out the stop in its totality. But that may be a question for you want to confirm with law enforcement. Great. Thank you. So page three, um, subsection two adds, you'll see that the executive director of racial equity is added to um, the stakeholders that have to work with law enforcement agencies on um, collecting uniform data, adopting uniform storage methods, and ensuring that any data collected it can be analyzed. Subsection three, right below that, um, requires that the executive director of racial equity receive the data <clears throat> in addition to the vendor that's chosen by the Criminal Justice Training Council for analyzing it. So, just in, so it ensures that um, that individual is receiving this roadside stop data collected by law enforcement. Um, bottom of the page, line 20, required, adds a requirement that the data be posted in a manner, in a manner that is user-friendly. And then top of page four um, requires that the agency that's receiving this data from law enforcement agencies report it annually to the General Assembly. <clears throat> and then in subdivision five there on the top of page four, you'll see that there are some parameters around what physical force means. Um, and it refers to the force that's employed by a law enforcement officer to compel that person's compliance with the officer's instructions and that includes compliance, um, contact controls, compliance techniques, defensive tactics, and deadly force. And those are all, I believe, terms of art in the, um, in the law enforcement world. And I can talk a little bit about what those mean if the committee would like contact, con what, what all those terms mean. Okay, Brian, before you do that, I do see two hands. I see um, Reps LeClaire and not. So, um, so Rob, go ahead. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> Brent, I'm looking just to bounce back to, uh, I guess it's page three, um, section two, where it talks about uh, the executive director of the racial equity. Uh, my question here is they're talking about choosing a vendor so is there not um, a, a database currently in place that we're using or are they looking to, I guess, buy a different one or get a different one to do different things? So this is a, that's existing law that talks about um, who the data has to go, who the who law enforcement agencies have to work with on. Oh, I see. Um, so we're, the only difference is we're just adding the executive director of racial equity. Right. Gotcha. That's Sorry. Right. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Will. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, same page down a little bit. Um, section four. Uh, the term user friendly. How how are we determining what qualifies as user friendly? I'm just thinking it's a very vague term. And for example, uh, someone who's used to analyzing law enforcement data might find something much more user friendly than say a community action group. So I'm just wondering how or when we, we define what qualifies as user friendly. We don't. And I don't disagree that it's a, that it's a term that has, that could have multiple meanings. Thanks. Okay, great. I'm um, not seeing anybody else. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Bryn. Sure. So I'm going back to page four. We're on that um, description of what physical force means at the top of the page. Um, and it refers to these sort of terms of art. And um, so this, these, this was an addition that was, um, that was made in the Senate. 
to sort of des describe with some specificity what physical force means. And this was at the request of um, the law enforcement agencies. So contact controls are defined by the Vermont State Police as techniques with little or no pain and other low level physical contact. Compliance techniques um, refer to <clears throat> the use of tasers, aerosol spray, impact weapons, empty hand controls, empty hand body strikes or takedowns, and police use of police canines. Defense tactics, defensive tactics are um, defined as impact weapon strikes, empty hand and defensive strikes. Um, so that comes directly from law enforcement. I, my, um, I would suggest that if there are more specific questions about those types of techniques, um, that that may be a question for law enforcement. Thank you, Bryn. Is it possible to have those definitions uh, posted on our committee pages, please? Yes, I can. Um, I can forward Mike um, the testimony that was received by Mark Anderson, um, which is where those def those definitions came from. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Tom. I uh, right. Yeah, 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 I, I just, uh, so Bryn, with, with these uh, uh, contact controls, compliance techniques, defensive tactics, all those already have definitions? Yeah, so those are, um, those are terms of art used in law enforcement that have, I think, generally associated understandings about them but not necessarily uh, definitions in, in law statute? No, okay. no that, they were not, um, those were not specifically defined here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna move on then um, to the next section, section four. We're now moving into um, a section that deals with prohibited restraints, types of restraints that are um, prohibited by this bill by law enforcement um, and the unprofessional conduct chapter. <clears throat> so section four, we're in the criminal justice training council chapter of title 20 now. Um, Subchapter two deals with unprofessional conduct. So um, you'll see here that the 2401 category A conduct is left um, left as is, no changes there. But if you turn to page five, close to the bottom, we get now into category B conduct. Um, this is the definition of category B conduct, gross professional misconduct. And um, the changes here, if you turn to page six, provide that um, there are two additional types of category B professional misconduct. The first is using, is law enforcement officer using a prohibited restraint on a person and that is defined um, down at the bottom of the page. We'll get there in a moment. Um, the second additional type of category B misconduct is um, failing if an officer fails to intervene when the officer witnesses another officer using a prohibited restraint or using excessive force. So those are two new types of category B misconduct for which the council can take um, disciplinary action on a law enforcement officer. Um. So no, um, excuse me, let me um, not RC, your hand is up. Yeah, I, thank you. I just have a quick question. Um, when it comes to intervening, how is there any sort of definition of what an intervention looks like when another officer obser is observing excessive force? Does it require does it require that officer to stop the other one or does it require him or her to make a notification to the supervisor? Is there anything further on that? There's no nothing further besides the word intervene. So um, I imagine that that would be open to interpretation by the council. Yeah, thank you. So I'm gonna move on to that definition of prohibited restraint. You're going to see this definition um, a couple more times in the bill. Uh, it defines prohibited restraint as the use of any maneuver on a person that applies pressure to the neck throat, windpipe, or carotid artery that may prevent or hinder breathing, reduce intake of air, or impede the flow of blood or oxygen to the brain. 
So I'm reading that definition because you're going to see it a few times um, since it is prohibited by the bill. Any questions there before I move on to 2407? Okay. So I'm going to move to page seven now, top of the page. This is um, 20, 2407 is um, an existing law that limits the Criminal Justice Training Council's ability to sanction an officer for, the, for a first offense of category B conduct. So the new language that you see there on lines six through 10 um, basically carves out those two new category B misconducts from that limitation. So a first offense of, a, of use of a prohibited restraint or a first offense of a failure to intervene may be sanctioned by the council according to this, this new language. Uh, Martin. Um, <clears throat> so to help me understand what 2407 really means, I mean, I went back and looked at the, the whole provision of, of misconduct. I, I'm just trying to understand when this would come into a, to play. And I, I guess that requires me to understand really what is the, what is the council doing uh, with these complaints? Because it seems to me that so long as the local law enforcement agency has done an appropriate investigation as defined here, what is the council's role? Do they, does it, it just wasn't clear to me. I, if there's, if, Let's just say that there's a, a category B conduct is, is alleged or complained against somebody. How does the process play out and what is the council's role? So because this 2407 exists, this limitation on when the council can become involved, um, I, I think I'll just start there. My, and this is, um, Again, this is, this is a, a statute that the Gover Government Operations Committee is probably pretty familiar with and they may understand this. Um, but my understanding is that law enforcement, this existing law was something that law enforcement lobbied for. Um, and the argument was that um, we should let the law enforcement officer, um, law enforcement officer's agency discipline that officer prior to having the council step in and impose any professional misconduct sanction. So let that first, um, that, that first instance of misconduct um, be handled by the law enforcement agency. Let it be a learning experience before it rises to the level of unprofessional conduct. So <clears throat> in the instance of a, of a second offense, um, when the council does step in, there's multiple different um, actions that the council can take to reprimand an officer. Um, and that includes, you know, a written warning. It includes everything from a written warning to um, a, a permanent decertification of, for the law enforcement officer. But there are, there are things that could happen in between those two as well. Okay. So, so, that, so the council, whatever the council imposes is in addition to whatever discipline the, uh, the local agency has imposed. Is that correct? Yes, that is my understanding. So cate category B conduct in under existing law, second offense of category B conduct can result in, again, that myriad of sanctions from the council, a written warning, a suspension, a revocation of the, of the law enforcement officer's certification with the option of recertification at the council's discretion um, or a permanent revocation of that law enforcement officer certification. Okay, all right, so I did have one other question. Uh, I'm, did the Senate, I guess it's the way I'll put this question. Did the Senate consider uh, expanding the exception to this first offense to the prohibited conduct or not, you know, to the category B conduct, excessive use of force. It seems like if you're going to have this exception for a prohibited restraint and failing to intervene, excessive use of force seems to be kind of equivalent badness or even the biased enforcement. And, and was there any discussion of why just these two, instead of expanding it to C and D, the excessive use of force or biased enforcement? There was some discussion about that, and um, it was 
it was decided that uh, Senator White would deal with that in her committee in the Senate Government Operations Committee. So it's my understanding that that is an issue that that committee is working on right now. Huh. Okay. Yeah, there's, uh, I, I don't know if it's in S-124, but, um, but that is a, uh, a bill looking at um, that conduct. And I believe that House Government Operations will look at that as well. So as I said, these three bills really do go together and there's quite a bit of, of overlap. Um, okay, Representative Hooper. Um, sorry to be so questioning, but Bryn, I'm looking through this and a lot of this is based on first offense, second offense. Where's the language that requires agencies to report to the training council when that first click has happened so that they know they're dealing with something that is a <clears throat> second offense as opposed to. You know, I have, this is not, um, Title 20 is not a title I work in with regularity. So I can't tell you off the top of my head where that language is, but um, I can find it and get but back to the committee. You, you think it exists? I do, yes. Okay. <laughs> if only Betsy Ann were here, she would know immediately and be able to answer you. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's, that's a frightening thing. <laughs> and no apologies for questions. That's, that's why we're here. So I appreciate your questions. Okay, Bryn. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to move on to section five now. <clears throat> Um, so this adds a new crime to Title 13, that's law enforcement use of prohibited restraint. Um, we start out by defining law enforcement officer. Um, and this is a pretty broad definition of law enforcement officer that's in the general provisions of um, the Criminal Justice Training Council chapter. It's a definition of law enforcement officer that we use quite regularly. Again, when you see that definition of prohibited restraint, it's the same one that exists in the unprofessional conduct section. And then um, the serious bodily injury definition, same as we use throughout Title 13. Um, and the new crime provides that uh, law enforcement officer acting in the officer's capacity as law enforcement who employs a prohibited restraint on a person that causes serious bodily injury or death shall be imprisoned for not more than 20 years or fined not more than $50,000 or both. And then you'll see subsection C there provides that nothing shall be construed to limit or restrict the availability of the justifiable homicide defense. And that subsection has been struck by Senate Judiciary in that instances of amendment that we looked at earlier. So that will no longer be there when you, when you, when you get S219 from the Senate. Okay, uh, Brynn, I actually see two hands and, and also Bryn, will you be talking about the conversation around justifiable homicide that I think is happening? That'd be helpful too, just to update sure. on, us on that. So we've got Tom and Nader. Um, I would defer to Nader first because uh, if he's uh, gonna say something around the same issue. Okay. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question, at, at first I was Glad to see that justified the justifiable homicide section was in there, and but now it's now I'm learning that it's gone, and I was wondering if there's any conversation, um, if you can enlighten us from the Senate's testimony as to why they decided to take out that section. Yes, yeah, sure thing. Um, committee, I'm going to need to take a brief five-minute break after I answer this question, if that's okay. Um, I'm getting some questions from the Senate um, that need to be answered before they go on the floor. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the conversation about the justifiable homicide defense was that that statute, um, justifiable homicide, it's at 13 BSA 2305, if anyone wants to look at it, is a statute that comes from, um, I have the history of it, I believe it was enacted in uh, the mid 1800s. It has quite a bit of language that needs updating and subsection C of that statute provides that essentially law for it provides a defense for law enforcement in um, their use of force to suppress riots 
for um, essentially to carry out any of their of their functions. And so it, there was a conversation in Senate Judiciary about um, whether or not it made sense for that specific defense to exist in combination with this new crime, um, because it may actually be uh, considered an, uh, that the legislature implied the repeal of that specific subsection because they are so diametrically opposed to each other. Um, so Senate Judiciary is planning on taking up the justifiable homicide statute on Thursday, in addition to um, another, another statute that sort of sets forth that law enforcement may um, use force in order to carry out its functions. Um, and so the idea was that by removing that reference, by removing the, the incorporating that statute by reference in subdivision C, that law enforcement will still have all of the common law defenses available to them, the self-defense common law um, defense, and also um, the justifiable homicide defense in sec subsections one and two, which are essentially um, provide that if a law enforcement officer wounds or kills another person, um, in defense of themselves or a whole host of other individuals, then they shall be guiltless. Um, or if a law enforcement officer, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, Pardon which me? section is that in? That's in 23, the 2305 okay. subsection one. There are three subsections under 2305. Right. The okay. first- I, I thought we were quoting a different um, statute, but okay, thank oh, you. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. So essentially, to, to, uh, that's a long-winded way of saying that common law defenses are still available um, to a law enforcement officer under this, new, under this new crime. But it was the decision of the Senate Judiciary Committee that that justifiable homicide statute needed some work um, before it would be incorporated by reference into the new crime. Thank you.